Obamacare nightmare is about to end. Vice President Mike Pence is in South Florida right now, part of a full court press in support of the American Health Care Act. We're a state that people know we care about our environment. The cost of clean water. State lawmakers have a pricey plan for an Everglades reservoir. Florida Senate president is right here with us to make that case. No charges filed. A mentally ill president may die in questionable circumstances, but no one is held responsible. We'll take it to the round table. Good morning. We begin today again with the push to repeal Obamacare and replace it with the American Health Care Act. But now we've seen the numbers. Health policy experts say the impact of the HCA, HCA on Florida next year and for years to come would be significant. Higher costs for older folks, less help, less subsidies from the government. Vice President Mike Pence is making the case for the GOP plan at a South Florida church right now. He did the same in Jacksonville yesterday. It is part of an all-out effort to garner support ahead of Thursday's scheduled vote in the U.S. House of Representatives. This week, the Congressional Budget Office issued its prediction. More than a million and a half Floridians, half a million of them in South Florida, covered under Obamacare would no longer be able to afford their plans under the GOP bill. And that is where we start today. Back with us today, Dr. Caroline Mortensen, Professor of Health Sector Management and Policy at the University of Miami. And Leah Kennard of Kendall is president of the Florida Nurses Association. She's formerly the chief nursing officer at the Jackson Health System. Good morning and welcome. Great to have you come back, yes. Dr. Kennard. Great to Thank have you. you come in. You are the one professional health care provider servicer sitting at this table this morning. We're glad you're here. Give us your impression of the American Health Care Act and what you think it would do for health care in Florida. Well, I would start off by saying concern, and that's because nurses and the American Nurses Association are uh, one of our primary principles is access to health care, especially for low income groups. And the new plan looks like that is a risk for people in our community. The, yeah, the number, this uh, Congressional Budget Office number is 14 million people nationwide losing coverage. In the first year, 24, in 10 years, 24 million losing coverage. Caroline, the, the numbers are so concerning that a lot of the GOP representatives came forward, you know, Yana Ross Layton was one of them, saying, I, you know, I can't support this bill in its current form because my constituents will lose. I, is that a headline or what is the context behind that? Well, ground zero, Florida is ground zero, according to the AARP, yeah. in terms of the effects of this replacement bill. Um, so they are estimating about half a million individuals aged 50 to 64 that live in South Florida that would see their, their subsidies disappear, their tax credits not be large enough to make that affordable care. Right now, according to things that I have read, the average person who is covered under the, uh, um, the Obamacare, the American uh, Affordable Care Act, is getting a subsidy of about $305 per month. That's the average. And under the new bill, that subsidy would pretty much go away. The subsidies would be based on income, and it wouldn't have to do with any health conditions that you have. And they would go from about $2,000 up to $4,000. You would have somebody who's age 60 getting a $4,000 tax credit, which means if they make $26,000, they'd be paying $14,000 in premiums. There is context behind that and reasoning behind that, but Leah, isn't that antithetical to health care providers? for the people who probably need it the most or are most vulnerable mm -hmm. to get the least amount of care. How, how mm -hmm. is that going to work? That, uh, absolutely. And, and the plan also uh, strips opportunities for preventive services, uh, I believe uh, tobacco cessation and some other pre preventive services are not included in it. So that puts people on a path that will lead to more difficult con conditions to uh, manage. Addiction services as well mm -hmm. would be significantly reduced or even eliminated under the new bill. Well, I, I believe there, and Caroline would know this, there is some funding that is continuing for the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. There are about 10 people a day in Florida who die from opioid addiction. And these are not necessarily people who are living on the street. This is illicit as well as prescribed drugs. And so uh, that is a growing healthcare issue in the country. And without more money that is 
built into it over a period of time, it's only going to get worse. So for Florida and for every state, but Florida in particular, the Medicaid portion, so much of the cut to Medicaid, and then uh, the, the governor is a proponent of taking a Medicaid block grant and having mm -hmm. the states have more control over their individual decisions where to go. I know the governor's administration is big into the opioid crisis and solving that. So is that, I don't know, a, a light in the darkness, if you will, having the state control over its Medicaid money and putting it where it thinks it should go? There are a lot of things that Lee and I want to talk about, about giving more flexibility to the states um, within Medicaid, but also in terms of, of nursing providers. Um, so looking at the block granting of Medicaid, it would be a per person, so per capita cap. Uh, I think the state of Florida largely has their hands tied because in 2014, we moved 40%, um, we had 40% Medicaid managed care rate. We moved it up to 80%. So that's the flow of funds is coming from the states to managed care companies, and managed care companies are making the decisions for Medicaid enrollees. Oh, okay, wait, slow down for a second. Yep. <laughs> so the block, there is no block grant right now, but Medicaid money coming to the state is going to managed care through the state decision. That's right. 80% of Medicaid enrollees in the state of Florida are now in managed care. And this is relatively new. It just started in 2014. And is that under Obamacare? No, that's completely, they made it clear, that's completely separate from the Affordable Care Act. I know that there was a test program, I believe, in Broward County. That's right. And uh, But there were some problems with the way that worked, and yet it was rolled out statewide. Very rapidly. For April to August 2014, it was rolled out very rapidly. So you took people from for service Medicaid, where it was volume-based reimbursement, now to managed care companies. It's actually been impressive. The managed care companies have provided a whole host of services that are not necessarily offered under fee-for-service Medicaid. So it has been an expansion in, in the richness of benefits yeah. that they yeah. receive. Uh, Leah, let me ask you, just so we sort of set the parameters here, Medicaid is the program for very poor people, disabled people, but a lot of pregnant women are also covered when they go to the hospital. Mm -hmm to have their babies. Uh, in fact, I have seen that more than I believe 50% mm -hmm. of the babies born in this country, the reimbursement to the hospital is through Medicaid. Um, is that in jeopardy now? Um, yes, it's in jeopardy. And the other side of it, and I'd like to talk about nursing a little bit, is that uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, see a higher percentage of Medicaid patients than other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's access to care that is not as expensive. Nurse practitioners are not reimbursed at the full rate that physicians are. And, uh, and, and all, all kinds of services, not just pregnant women. Mm -hmm. um, a major issue in the services of nurse practitioners. Now the Affordable Care Act was good for nurses. And I like to think that what's good for nurses is good for patients. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, the Affordable Care Act has expanded the role, it's, it's probably not the best, it, it dealt with the role of nurses and gave nurses more opportunities to provide services in primary care. And th I, that is what I think you're basically talking about. Mm -hmm. It's stripping funds from primary care. But stripping funds from nurse nurses practicing in that sort of care? Right. It, is that spelled out in the bill? The, it doesn't, the, uh, the new bill, AHCA, does not address the role of nurses. The, uh, the Affordable Care Act exp it provided all kinds of opportunities for nurses. Now in Florida, we have a bit of a problem because Florida has been the slowest state in the union to be able to deal with opportunities for nurse practitioners. We were the last state, and it only happened last year after 23 years of going to the legislature, that nurse practitioners can begin to prescribe controlled substances. So there is concern about where people will get their care, especially in rural environments. I was just gonna say, I'm sure nurse practitioners uh, provide a service everywhere, but particularly in rural areas where there are fewer MDs or DOs. Absolutely, and if, if that, those services are not there, that means people have to travel, they don't have the funds to travel, people actually will not get care. We have a lot more to talk about on this. We're gonna take a quick break and come right back. Welcome back live in our studio this morning to experts on healthcare policy, and we are talking about 
the American Health Care Act, which would replace Obamacare if it's going to be passed by Congress, vote on Thursday in the House of Representatives, a major vote. Uh, Caroline Mortensen, let me ask you uh, about safety net hospitals uh, in Florida, like Broward Health and Jackson Health System. Uh, they treat a lot of indigent people, mm -hmm. uh, and Medicaid goes a long way towards paying the cost of that. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if Medicaid is cut back, what does Jackson do, for example? Uh, that's a great question. So Florida is different from a lot of other states. Again, we're not a Medicaid expansion state. And um, part of the Affordable Care Act was cutting down payments to hospitals because they were assuming that they, more and more people would get enrolled in Medicaid. So Florida has something called a, a limited low income pool Ooh, that right. goes to the hospitals. The and they the, the LIP, that's right. Yeah. And that's getting cut year by year. So this yeah. is actually the last year where we know that there's going to be money in there, which really emphasizes the importance of programs like Medicaid, where you know you may not get paid as much as Medicare or private insurance, but you would get a payment for the patients that are treating. So if it comes to pass that so many more millions of people are uninsured, which is really the case prior to Obamacare, when all of these people looked to have urgent or emergency needs or catastrophic care, they would go to places like public hospitals mm -hmm. and the taxpayers would end up footing their bill mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway. So what is, I, I guess I don't understand the theory behind taking insurance away and going back to that process financially. Oh, I don't, do you. I don't understand it either. <laughs> no. I, don't know. I mean, I think ultimately we're going to start feeling the effects of this because if more patients go to Jackson that are not getting reimbursed for, our insurance premiums are going to go course. up. Florida has 20 of the 50, 50 highest charging hospitals in the country. 20 of them are in Florida, 40%. We have expensive hospitals in the state. We're paying for that because our employer coverage gets more expensive each year. You know, that, that brings up a really interesting question because we, we talk about coverage, the cost of coverage, but really the cost of coverage is different from the cost of care. And even, uh, you know, even with a, an insurance policy, a, even a bare bones insurance policy or more, a, a person may not be able to use that policy because they can't afford the care anyway. It, right. it, what, it, what is the solution? How, what is the path to take for the cost of care, the $8 aspirins for instance, mm -hmm. why, why do aspirins in hospitals cost $8? Well, <laughs> you ask a very fascinating question because it's very hard to know what the cost of care is. And that's a, a transparency issue. You can go buy an aspirin at a drugstore, but you will not know what your aspirin is going to cost you in, in provider services. And th what that does is it takes me back to what you were talking about even before the ACA. Healthcare has been a mess. I mean, we 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 do the very best we can. Um, we're we're not high ranking in terms of um, how we compare with other countries, uh, Westernized countries, and and in, yet in cost of care or care in 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 care and the results of care. And something that I think that people must begin to think about is what is the personal responsibility to find out as much as I can. And a question that I like to teach people is to always ask, what difference will it make? What difference will it make if I have the procedure, if I don't have the procedure, if I wait? And because we have to think differently about providing services. We're a culture that thinks more is better. And isn't that one of the tenets behind this AHCA, is that if people have a pool of their own money, they will take more responsibility for their own care and learning the costs of care. It, that's, is that valid? If you're wealthy. Okay. Oh, and if you understand well. the prices that you're that you're facing, people don't comparison price shop for healthcare. It's impossible to figure out the there, prices. There is almost time. no good consumer of healthcare because we can't go out and say, oh, if I buy it at hospital A, it's this much, and hospital B, it's that much, or I want my MRI here or there uh, because of the cost difference. I mean, we don't do that, well, and that our means. insurance companies. Uh, really dictate in a way where we do get it. Isn't that changing though? In Florida there is now a push for transparency. You're laughing. I, I'm, I'm okay. sorry, I am laughing. Uh, there it was a transparency bill. The most aggressive bill in the country was passed last week. But um, the company that is charged with revealing the prices for the cost of care is funded by the three large insurers in the state of Florida. So it's not clear mm -hmm. that it's actually transparent at all if you have the same insurance companies funneling the organization that's going to reveal the transparency numbers. So it's a little unclear how that will go forward. Let me ask you kind of a basic equity question about the uh, American Her Health Care Act versus Obamacare. Um, 
under Obamacare, as we all know, there is an individual mandate mm -hmm. requires people mm -hmm. to buy insurance uh, or they are have to pay a penalty under the American Health Care Act that goes away, which uh, ostensibly I think it's, you know, they're assuming a lot of young people are going to drop out because they're healthy. Why should I buy mm -hmm. uh, insurance? But right. in fact, the tax breaks for young people, especially those making over $30,000 a year, are pretty generous as opposed to people 50 to 64 who are ill and they're... Uh, subsidy goes down significantly. I mean, there's just, it doesn't seem very fair. Oh, well, even if it's, and I, I, I'd look to Caroline about this, but my thought about um, insurance is when, when you're well is also when you need it because you don't know when you're going to be in, a, in an accident. You don't know when you might get cancer or heart disease. And so for young people to think that they can go insurance bare is a mistake. And so the intention of the of Obamacare was to be able to fund pre-existing condition folks mm -hmm. with the well population. And um, that, that has not been successful. Now how it will work with the AHCA, I don't know. Well, I think the CBO says it best. You're taking $880 billion out of Medicaid, which is by definition low, very low income, young people as well as over 65 population, and you're funneling that into the largest costs in the AHCA bill are the costs of the tax cuts that are going to the wealthy, the wealthy corporations. $600 billion in Over tax $600 cuts. billion dollars in tax cuts and taking away $880 billion from the people who need it most. Yeah, the top 2% wage earners, income earners, uh, receivers in this country, uh, would do very well mm -hmm. under the American Health Care Act, mm -hmm. and the poor and the middle class, not so well. That's correct. More to come on this subject, no doubt. I hope you will be back with us as this unfolds. Vote we in the need house help explaining it. <laughs> Tough to get your to arms recover. around it. <laughs> All right. But we're doing our best. Up next, a fight in Tallahassee over a huge and costly reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee. The chief proponent is Florida Senate President Joe Negron, and he joins us right here after the break. Clean water, a basic necessity of life, is at the center of a big debate in Tallahassee these days as Florida lawmakers take up how much to spend on cleaning and restoring the Everglades. Senate Bill 10 is advancing through the Florida Senate. It has big goals and a big price tag and a big proponent in Senate President Joe Negron, who is here right with us this morning to talk all about it. Good morning and thank you for being with us today. Good morning, Senator. Glad to have the opportunity. All right, you are on this campaign to buy, have the state buy 60,000 acres of agricultural land south of the lake for above ground reservoirs, but you're getting some pushback from House Speaker Richard Corcoran, and the governor doesn't like this at all. So how are you gonna do this? Well, first of all, I think the governor does support water going south, and the 60,000 acres that we need, um, I'm open to looking at a combination of ideas, including some land the state owns um, south of Lake Okeechobee. The goal is simply to have a place for <clears throat> water to go rather than east and west where it destroys estuaries and our waterways. Right. Well, it destroyed the waterways near you're from Stewart. Correct. And on the eastern side of the state, we saw that toxic green sludge last year, awful smelling, uh, bad for the environment, bad for the economy, happened on the west coast over in Lee County as well. Yes, and it's, it, we can do better than that. There's always been a plan for increased southern storage. The issue is really where to do it and when to do it. So what I'm saying is that in order to avoid these situations in the future. The governor declared a state of emergency for right. over 200 days. Businesses are out and gone. Uh, we had uh, situations where literally there were signs in the ocean that you couldn't swim there because of the dangerous conditions. So right. I think there's a way that we can put more southern storage south and look at other options to make sure that the Army Corps has options rather than just flooding billions of gallons of polluted water from Lake estu Okeechobee. into estuaries that were never intended to absorb that. So this huge reservoir to the south has big blowback from particularly sugar and sugar right. farmers and those that depend on that industry. Why there? What, what are the other options? Are there other options? Well, there's certainly other uh, components of the plan. I think having additional southern storage is an indispensable component because no matter how much storage you have in other places, when we, when we get a lot of rain in the summer in Florida, which we do frequently, 
and the lake gets to 16 feet, whether we like it or not, the Army Corps is going to open up the floodgates. So I'm certainly willing to look at storage north of the lake as an option and also to look at land the state owns south of Lake Okeechobee to augment the amount of storage that we need. We certainly want to be sensitive to the agricultural community. We don't want to have any adverse economic impacts anywhere, but we simply can't have a situation where the best we can do in 2017 is that periodically we destroy seagrasses, destroy oyster beds, literally 18 inches of guacamole-like septic conditions, manatees poking their heads up trying to get over the sludge debris so that they don't drown. No one has a right to pollute the environment that way. And so I think if we do a combination of those storage opportunities, we can avoid these discharges in the future. What, can, when, I, can I just follow course, that up? What happened, all of this pollution, it, phosphorus based pollution from the sugar industry runoff, remind us what happened a couple of years ago when legally the sugar industry was bound to pay for that cleanup. <laughs> Well, the goal is for the water going into the lake to be as clean as it can be. And I think the agriculture community has made progress in making sure that their effect on the environment um, has been favorable compared to how it was 15 or 20 years ago. The issue right now for me is not so much the quality of the water, which of course we want to monitor, but it's the quantity. We simply cannot have a situation where literally hundreds of billions of gallons of water, fresh water, are flowing into communities that were never designed to take it. As most of your viewers know, um, the water used to flow south and it would go into what is now Everglades National Park and out to Florida Bay. Obviously we have 30,000 people who live south of the lake. We have cities that have been built with all kinds of uh, drainage devices and, and we can't undo history. But the reality is the, the, the trade-off that we did where we said, well, we'll just manufacture these canals to go flood southeast Florida and southwest Florida we heard from yeah. business owners, we're losing tourists, we're losing fishermen and women coming to our community, tournaments are being canceled, and the most important thing this morning that I want to say is, if Florida ever got the reputation that our waterways aren't clean, that our mm -hmm. ocean isn't pristine, that Florida Bay doesn't have enough water, that's, what, that's the reputation of Florida. We're a, we're a state that people know we care about our environment that if you come to Florida, you're going to have beautiful rivers and waterways that are clean for you and your family and your business. And that's, my, that's what my goal is. And a couple of years ago, Florida voters said, yes, we believe in they that did. very thing. And they passed Amendment 1, and it produces, what, roughly $700 million that's a correct. year in tax revenue. Uh, and is that the money that would fund this huge project? Because the price tag here, the last time I saw, it was like $1.2 billion dollars and then you expanded it for waterways beyond uh, south of the lake and now it's up to about three billion dollars. We're talking about a lot of money. The voters approved Amendment 1 by over 70 percent. That's more than many of us got when we were elected or re-elected. They made it clear that we wanted to purchase environmentally sensitive land in order to make sure that our waters are clean and that we have good stewardship of the environment. So we have the funding available it also, the amendment, clearly authorizes and anticipates bonding. And so to me, once the voters have spoken, we need to implement the will of the people, and their will was that we have enough land to make sure that we don't have these toxic discharges. Senate President Negron was here actually late this week to record that interview, which is why we're wearing different clothing. You can see the interview in its entirety on Local10.com. Our Powerhouse Roundtable is here in its entirety next. Welcome back. We have a roundtable redo this week for perspective and analysis of the big issues of the week. We are going to pick up where we left off last week with the same all-star cast, <laughs> Melba Pearson, Deputy Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Florida. She formerly was with the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office. Rafael Yanez is a political activist and analyst who graduated from the University of Florida and the UM School of Law. And Mara Lee Concio is a Miami-based attorney who is active in the Republican Party and a member of the Governor's Commission on Healthcare and Hospital Funding. Do I have the name of the commission right? It was something like that. Right? It, it, you have it right. Yeah. Okay, well, Mara Lee, since you were on that commission and you follow healthcare policy, the House of Representatives scheduled Thursday to vote on the American Healthcare Act. 
president picked up a few votes late this week with some conservatives. He came and said, okay, I'll cut back on Medicaid benefits a little bit, and a few people signed on. Is this going to pass? I certainly hope so, because the alternative is that we continue having Obamacare, and that is unsustainable, and we need to do something better for the American people. I truly hope that this is that one chance for Republicans that have complete control the House and Senate to pass something that it's better for everybody, I'm better for businesses. I'm going to respectfully disagree with my friend Madi Lee here because I'm actually quite concerned as a Republican that this bill as it stands today is a death sentence for our majorities in Congress. A it's a death, death sentence, sentence. a death that. sentence. You mean 2018 elections? 2018 and 2020. I believe if we I, were I to pass it I as think, today. You know, I disagree. I think that if we don't pass it, that's when we're going to lose because they were elected to office because we're going to repeal Obamacare. Correct. They're, they were elected because there is palpable frustration amongst our communities and our friendship circles and people we don't know across this country who are very upset with the way the Affordable Care Act was implemented and maybe even designed in some cases. But right. I believe that the way this bill has been written, the CBO is pointing out the, the, the dire flaws in this bill. And you trust the CBO that was wrong by 13 million people that were supposed to be signed up to Obamacare and are not? So I don't That's trust the CBO. That's a fair point. CBO. I'm not, I'm not however, going to defend the CBO. However, the, there is an internal White House memo that actually puts the number up at 26 million. Right. So we're looking at two different organizations facts, coming Facts, alternative facts. 20, but either way, 24 million, 26 million, these are a lot of Americans who are going to be 20 million people decided impacted. not to sign up to Obamacare and chose to pay a fine last year. Right. So 20 million people of those 26 perhaps chose not to have insurance. We need to do something different. We have a health crisis in this country, and it's not by having an insurance card that's going to be fixed. We need to have better care for our people Correct. and affordable because affordability is the main reason that some people don't have access and to insurance. Well, it's clear this bill is not going to accomplish that. So. You know, Tom Price was on, the um, HHS Secretary, Dr. Tom Price, was on the cables this morning and right. said, look, this is, the vote is about this particular part of administrative policy. It's not the plan. He said it's not the plan. The plan is in three parts. But if it's not the plan and the first vote is going to be taken on Thursday and mm -hmm. you have a significant majority of GOP representatives who are concerned because they're hearing from their constituents, wh what are we to think? My congresswoman, hmm? Ileana Ross Lane, was the first Republican to step out and say proudly that she will not support this plan. And she's been criticized by some members of our community, and she's been lauded by others. I will laud her. I think she's making the right decision here. This is not the right plan. Yeah. We she's need to amend it. She's also my congresswoman, Rafael, and I was in consulted. I'm also a constituent of hers, and I believe that we need to do something better for the American people. And eliminating Obamacare, it's the first step. Well, well, she, has, to she, has, it. she has 96,300 people in her congressional district who are enrolled through healthcare.gov, and I think she is an excellent politician, and she is hearing from them, and she is saying, I can't abandon them. The Most problem, of them is, are the problem is exactly that, Michael. It's politics. It's about well, the how, election you can't campaigns. Get rid of politics well, but that, that's the problem. Are we talking about health care? Are we taking care of people, or we're concerned about you know what uh, you know what's going to happen in the next election, and who's going to oppose us because we voted in favor of something because you voted with Trump? That's the reality. It's like people don't like the president, so they don't want to sign up to their to his policies, and that's well, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree again on that because we have. As we had mentioned before, there are so many high-profile organizations that are tied to the medical community, doctors and nurses, who completely disagree with this plan. And they're not about getting involved in politics. They're about the patients and the people who are going to suffer, including the disabled, including women. So I can tell you that throwing money uh, at a system does not work. There's better ways. When you offer two to $4,000 a person, they're going to find alternative ways of receiving care because I'm not concerned about who has an insurance card. I'm right. concerned of who is able to go but to a doctor and receive care. I'm concerned care. that this plan does not satisfy that issue, which is how do you make sure they actually receive the care? Because right now, if they have an emergency, they're going to be treated at any hospital under EMTALA. But you need to see what's going on with these deductibles. The Obamacare plans and their $10,000 deductibles are bankrupting families, the same way families were being bankrupted before when they had no health care and the hospital was sending them a $20,000 bill. But you seem bill. to be in favor of continuing with that. When I'm not in favor of notes. continuing with the Obamacare as it stands so, today. What exactly. I'm in favor of is replacing before you repeal. I've been saying this from the beginning. We Republicans are losing the media message. I can't believe we won both houses of Congress and the White House and we continue to beat a dead horse. We need to replace 
then repeal the bad parts. And Marilee, you know what I wanted to ask you? On, on the commission, on the state commission, that, that was about transparency mostly, is that right? Yes. And so what we talked about in the first segment, the cost of care and the prices and people unable to comparison shop because there is very little transparency between what you pay for. What, did, what came out of the commission? What were the steps? What was the progress? You know, what, what I know is that hospitals make a lot of money, even though sometimes in paper they, they say they, they are losing money. Well, there's for-profit and not-for-profit. Exa well, <laughs> let's not even talk about the not-for-profit hospitals. Some not-for-profit hospitals right. have billions of dollars in, in their foundations and reserves that, I, that it's mind-boggling. Seventy percent of all the money spent in health care is paid by the government in the state of Florida, 70 percent. So private insurance only accounts for about 30 percent. Of that 30%, that's what we're talking about here, because if it's Medicare, Medicaid, government employees, veterans, they have different insurance. So the public, people like most of us, some have employer-provided insurance. Most, maybe most of you do. I'm a small business owner, and small business owners are the ones that feel the brunt of the pain of having to go get insurance for them, their families, and employees. And that's and what I'm telling you. your choices are limited. Your choices are right Very now limited. artificially constricted. But that's why small business sentiment is up, and that's why right. CEOs are My in father's favor a small business owner, and exactly. he's luckily now uh, a semi-retired. He's under Medicare. And before that, he was covered generously through my mother's plan, and he had major health episodes that would have bankrupted my family, but for being under a, an employer-mandated insurance. What about the families who aren't so lucky? And yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite yeah. concerned that right now, health care, access to health care, access to true health care, the public has felt the, the, the comfort of the security blanket of the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. Now we're dealing to pay the price, and we need to replace before we repeal. And I think one of the more positive things that I saw this week about compassion, humanity, was Florida Atlantic University did a mm -hmm. poll this week. And 76% of Floridians say they're terribly worried that older, poor people are going to lose their access to health care right. under the American Health Care Act. Maybe it's not good under Obamacare, but they say, you know, for these people to lose that care is abominable. It's and, unacceptable. And additionally, you have to worry about our, our citizens, our uh, friends and family members who have disabilities, who yes, are currently right. under yes. disability insurance, and there's going to be caps under this proposed plan, which would cause someone with disabilities not to be able to be frank, to, it's to unconscionable. Take care of them, uh, it's unconscionable. We're missing Absolutely. on the compassion, compassion conservatism that was a hallmark of the George Bush years. And I, it's no secret, I'm a Republican. I'm very upset that the Republican Congress under the George Bush administration ignored health care. I blame Obamacare on the inaction of the Republicans when they were in charge before. Now we have the White House, we have the Senate, we have the House, and we seem to be going back in circles. Just because we had a bad plan before doesn't mean that any plan will fix it now. We need to have a concise, targeted, surgical well, plan to perhaps, fix Obamacare. Yeah, Raphael, perhaps by the time the Senate gets a bill and then it goes into a conference committee, right. some of these things may be ironed out. If not, Let's pray. the whole future of uh, the presidency of Donald Trump is somewhat in question. Anyway, we'll be back with more Roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back to a rockin' round table today. And since we have a table full of legal minds, um, I want to talk about a woman in, uh, named Aramis Ayala. You may not know her. People in South Flor uh, Central Florida do. She is the state attorney there. She made a decision this week to not seek the death penalty in the case of a man who murdered a police lieutenant. And Governor Rick Scott duly removed her from that case. Melba, you wrote a column on that for Huffington Post. I that did. is something that you oppose. Tell us why. Absolutely. Let me start with one thing. This crime is completely disgusting and horrible. So I want to make sure that is clear. However, the governor completely overstepped his bounds by removing the state attorney. Bottom line is, the state attorney is elected by her constituents. She's elected by the people in the city of Orlando. And she was elected to do a job. She has prosecutorial discretion and can decide whether or not to seek the death penalty, what charges are appropriate, what the protocol should be in her office. She is within her bounds to do so. The governor has now interfered in the judicial process. There is a statute that allows him to step in, yes. but it's a statute that generally is for an ethical conflict, not for 
prosecutorial a charge, bringing a charge, and not bringing a charge. That is absolutely correct, Michael. It's a matter of, number one, disqualification. So, for instance, she's married to the victim or has a close personal relationship right. with parties involved. That would be grounds for disqualification. And the other part of it is good and sufficient reason in order to make sure the ends of justice is served. But disagreeing with her handling of a case is not proper grounds I, will I respectfully disagree because the governor is the chief law enforcement officer in the state and the state attorneys have a duty to enforce the laws. Now I agree with you that maybe she had the prosecutor prosecutorial discretion in this case. However, I believe firmly if the laws in Florida state that you could be tried by death penalty, by a death penalty jury, and suffer the harshest crime we have available, or the harshest penalty for harshest crimes, and she chose not to put this case in front of a jury, but it's more that's than, unconscionable. Right, but it's, it's more than that. She said that she was not going to pursue any due death to, penalty. Well, due and to that's, chaos in the right, legal and system, look, uncertainty. What, mm -hmm. This well, which is he, he killed a law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. He killed up his he, pregnant he's girlfriend. Alleged to have this, if anybody, if right. anybody should, you know, receive the death penalty would be him if found guilty. What, well, what she had said was, what I read was, that she said was that she found no public safety benefit to the death penalty and will not seek the death but penalty. But when you, when, that, when that you get elected, the scope of discretion, right, but when you get elected, opinion. you put your hand uh, on a Bible or a document, and you swear to follow the constitution of the state. And right. seeking and life without parole is part of the constitution. However, I have been, having been, been a prosecutor, having been a prosecutor and handled homicide cases, I have made the decision as to whether or not to seek death in a but case. But it's different. Did you ever say, I'm never going to seek the death penalty in right. any case? Did you ever come out and publicly say that? I think that's the difference. No, but you it's not that you make a choice in one case. You're just saying, in my office, we're not going to seek the death However, penalty case. The law in the state of Florida has changed with regards to the death penalty. No, it has to be unanimous. Exactly. Right. But it still but goes, it's still a jury decision. It's still, I believe and it should go to the jury. But it's still a prosecutor's sentence. decision as to whether or not to seek the death penalty. And if she decided, I don't want to be that test case with what would happen if I don't have a unanimous jury and then have to try it again yeah. and put the victim's families through it again well, and bring witnesses back. Well, and she, would, she wouldn't have to try it again months. because if the jury is not unanimous, it becomes an automatic life, life sentence if they're able to convict but not reach unanimity. So I, I don't believe that it's fair to compare your honorable experience down here in Miami with this case because you behaved within the scope of your office. She is exceeding the scope of her office by making a political decision not to prosecute any death penalty yeah, but case. But it's not a political the, decision. The, it's within her discretion. Question, I think the question that is raised by this is, in every judicial circuit in the state of Florida, uh, is the governor going to step in when he doesn't like a decision by the and state? And he's not up for election in a capital case. Well, that's up for something debate for something different. And Let but, me rephrase: He's not for re-election. However, the question is, what kind of precedent are you setting? Mm -hmm. So, right. if let's say there's a prosecutor that's investigating wrongdoing in the executive branch in the governor's office, is he now going to remove that oh, prosecutor on, you guys, you guys, and appoint a different one? The blowback that's, there would be that's the precedent immense. that's being set. Yeah. That's the precedent. All right. Before we run out of time, there is a finally a decision this week in the death of Darren Rainey. Darren Rainey, 50-year-old black man. Uh, a small-time drug dealer who was doing a two-year sentence at the Dade Correctional Institution on June 23rd, uh, 2012, uh, he died in that facility. He, two guards put him in a long, narrow shower. Uh, he could not control the water temperature. Some inmates there said it was used as a form of punishment, either very cold water, very hot water. Anyway, they left him in, in there for two hours. Mm -hmm. and. Right he was found dead on the bottom on the floor of the shower um, and this week the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office uh, Melba said uh, they did an exhaustive study mm -hmm. and it took nearly five years and they said we can't find any culpability we're not bringing charges against anyone a man mm -hmm. dies in prison in state custody and nobody is charged how can that be I understand that this is definitely very disturbing. I've read the report. It's, all the facts of this are very, very disturbing. However, the question always is whether or not you can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt in the court of law. And Ms. Rundle believed that she could not prove it beyond mm -hmm. a reasonable doubt. That does not mean there wasn't wrongdoing. That doesn't mean right. the guards didn't do something wrong. Right. It's just that it cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But 
what the key issue is here. We need to have a federal investigation into our prisons here in Florida to make sure there's not a pattern of abuse and neglect yeah. going on I'm, and people are suffering wrongfully. I'm concerned with what the Legislative Black Caucus is going to say about this, our representatives in Tallahassee, because with the Black Lives Matter movement saying that police brutality is, is killing black men and women across this country, we're in a relatively quiet racial tension period right now. And Catherine Fernandez Rundle won by acclamation this past election. No one challenged her on the ballot. And now, on a weekend, when everything's nice and calm, the weather's beautiful in Miami, this, what should be a controversial decision, was dropped on all of us because it is an unconscionable action that took place in state custody, and now the man is dead. What do we say to his family? Well, ha actually, though, if you read the closeout report, I think what they, the state attorney lays out why there is no evidence to support a prosecution well, because of the lack of malice and right. conflicting Conflicting statements. The statements. 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 But, but the circumstantial yeah. evidence. I'm sorry, but we, you know, uh, prior to the show, the three of us were talking, and we, I believe that this should have gone to a jury right. to decide. Yes. They could have, uh, you know, charged him with manslaughter, but you don't right. leave somebody in the shower where they have no control of hot or cold or able to leave the shower right. with no supervision for that long a period of time. So clearly there was I'd negligence. And, and it's something that yeah. maybe they didn't have the evidence, but let the jury decide. All right, that's going to be the final word. Thank you all. A wonderful roundtable. Glad you. you could come back. Still to come, my personal perspective about the death of Darren Rainey. Stay tuned. Before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about that Florida prison inmate, Darren Rainey. He is dead under mysterious circumstances and no one is responsible. That is the inescapable conclusion you get when you read this closeout memo from the Miami-Dade Miami State Attorney's Office. It is thick, it's exhaustive, and late, very late. Darren Rainey died nearly five years ago, June 2012, at the Dade Correctional Institution down near Homestead. It took almost five years to decide that no crime was committed. Justice is not only blind, she's lame. Darren Rainey died in a shower at that state prison. Here is video of DCI showing Rainey being walked out of his cell. That's where he had defecated and then smeared the feces on himself. But the first time he had done it, Rainey was mentally ill, a schizophrenic on heavy duty meds. Now, to be sure, prison guards had their hands full with this guy, but what did they do? They locked Aaron Rainey into a shower, then turned it on, hot water left him there for nearly two hours. Rainey had no control over the water temperature, Corrections officer says he made sure it was not too hot or too cold, but there is no way to tell. Other inmates told the Miami Herald's Julie Brown that guards regularly put them in that shower in either ice cold or scalding hot water as punishment. It's the sadistic stuff. The investigation says those half dozen inmates who were talking about Rainey being scalded were unreliable, but a prison nurse who examined Rainey's body says it was so hot afterwards that she could not get a reading on a thermometer and his skin was peeling off. Still, nobody's going to be charged for the crime. Nobody's going to be held responsible for Darren Rainey's death. I find that unbelievable. How can it be? One reason is that the investigation by Miami-Dade police was slipshod from the start. They got serious only when the Herald's Julie Brown and others, including me, started asking questions. Well, the closeout memo leaves important questions unanswered. The Civil Rights Division of Justice may still answer them. And if you're wondering if a small-time drug dealer who was mentally ill deserves all this media attention, the answer is yes. As it says in the book of Matthew, inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it unto me. That is my perspective for this week. I hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And get online. We would love to hear from you on any topic you like, something that you've seen here, something on your mind. Here are some addresses. We are very easy to find, and we love to hear your perspective. And we do respond, so <laughs> we're in touch. You be in touch. Have a great Sunday.